I'll start with the staff at the Humanities Institute. As many of you know, uh, you know, you have, you know, presidents and provosts and vice presidents and deans and faculty and all of that. But the, the truth is, is that the staff make the university work, right? They wind up being the most important people. So we have folks like uh, Jake Levitin, uh, Victoria Day, Caden Gillespie, who really do the bulk of uh, the work in the unit that you wind up seeing and gets associated with either our director, Ron Brolio, or the associate director. And we're happy to take the credit. Uh, but the fact is, is uh, that the staff people really do uh, great work and make us look great all the time. So thank you to them. Um, my colleagues and shippers, for those of you who are here and those who are not, who may be uh, online or might just hear about it, I want to thank them for their support, uh, as always, especially uh, Richard here. Thank you for coming out, Richard, and certainly the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, uh, which we work under, that make all of our programming possible. We wouldn't be able to do any of the things that we do without the leadership we have in Dean Cohen. So thank you so much, uh, Dean Cohen, for allowing us to operate, uh, especially in the kinds of times we find ourselves in now. We are having hard conversations on campuses all over the country. And uh, sometimes you have leadership who don't appreciate that. That is not the case in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And we're so grateful for, for good leadership. Uh, so having said that, I want to introduce you to our speaker for tonight. And it's a, a person I've known actually for many, many years. Like I was a, I, I guess I was a kid uh, when I met him. I was a teenager and um, I'm a first generation student. Nobody in my family, well, I guess that's what that means. Nobody had ever been to college. And so I was looking for a book on the Black Panther Party after learning about it for the first time. And I was looking for a few books, right? It was three books, not just one. So that's my defense. And they weren't in the library uh, where I went to school. So I got on a plane and went to California uh, to find the books. Yeah. Uh, nobody mentioned, you know, there's an interlibrary loan. Uh, so I, I did that, and I was hanging out with some friends of mine who, who wound up picking me up at the airport and showing me around Oakland and San Francisco. And one of my good friend's girlfriend, he was, he was in law school at the time, he's at Berkeley, and he was gone, so I'm hanging out with his girlfriend at his house. And she's like, well, who are you? And what are you doing here, you know? And she was really cute, so I'm thinking, hmm. Uh, but then when I told her who I was and what I was doing there, she goes, oh, I know somebody in the Black Panther Party, you should, you should meet him, you know? Like, you don't know anybody at the Black Panther Party. Uh, and it turns out she did. She um, had a nut, I guess she still has a nut, who was actually, I hope you don't mind me saying, Emory's girlfriend at the time. Uh, she says, my aunt is dating a member of the Black Panther Party. I think, I bet she'd introduce you to him. And, uh, and she did, like I went to her aunt's house and there was this person who I had been reading about at that point for a couple of years and was really, really uh, excited and, and proud to meet and I've been excited. Uh, to know him for a long time. And that was, my friends, 1991, right? So longer than maybe some of the people you know have been living. Maybe longer than some of you have been living. So I met him all the way back then, but I will say it was 1996 when he finally told me something I couldn't find in a book. Uh, so that took some doing. That, that relationship took some, some building. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we have our discussion. So that's enough about me. Let me tell you about our speaker tonight. I've got the honor of introducing Emory Douglas, one of the most influential revolutionary artists working today. His graphic design work has been beloved and has inspired change globally for its visual language that is not only provocative, but also overflows with dignity, agency, and care. Utilizing art throughout his career as a tool to inspire for the thought and action, Douglas's bold graphic style and explicit imagery have largely contributed to the visual global glossary of shared struggle and liberation and continue to resonate with contemporary audiences today. Born in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1943 and residing in San Francisco, California since 1951, Douglas was struck at a young age by the injustices he and other black Americans suffered across the United States 
He attended City College in San Francisco, where he studied commercial art and continuously traveled to San Francisco State to hear civil rights leaders speak. I think we heard uh, last night that he was on the San Francisco State campus so, so much that people thought he was a student there, but turns out he was just hanging out. Um, in early 1967, he became involved with the Black Arts Movement, creating promotional artworks for events across the city. He worked with people like Sonia Sanchez and Amir Baraka as he did this. And from 1967 to the early 1980s, when the party dissolved, Douglas served as revolutionary artist and later as Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. In these roles, he helped define the aesthetics of protest and revolution in the Black Power Movement, creating work that resonated uh, with many, many of the issues that were sort of bubbling up to the surface during that particular historical moment. With his work on Black Panther newspaper, he maintained a commitment to creating imagery and designs that told stories of black American struggle from a firsthand perspective and that could inform and educate the community. His past work has been celebrated in retrospective shows and publications, including at the Los Angeles Museum of Com Contemporary Art in 2008 and the New Museum in New York City in 2009. Douglas's work has resonated with audiences around the world through exhibitions, workshops, lectures, and collaborations. These include the 2008 Sydney Biennale and the music um, at, I'm sorry, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Glasgow International Art Festival, Uh, I don't mind at all, thank you. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, and Vertigo Gallery in Mexico City, just to name a few, and it really is a few. When I asked Douglas to send his bio, uh, I got it and opened it. It was 14 pages. So I didn't just read you 14 pages of stuff, but that's um, kind of what he's been up to. In 2015, he received the American Institute of Graphic Art Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2022, he was inducted into the Society of Illustrators Hall of Fame. And in 2023, he received a Black New World Award for his contribution to black media over the decades. Douglas continues to work as a political artist and activist, harnessing text and image to create timely artworks which speak directly to matters of injustice and liberation. And we are honored tonight to have him at ASU. And so would you please join me in giving him a warm Sun Devil welcome. Uh, thank you. Can you, you can hear me? Just in case I go out, maybe I should keep that mic over here as well. But I'd like to start off saying all power to the people, as we would say in the Black Panther Party. And, uh, but what I'm going to do is show some retrospective artwork that remixes an interpretation from work I did in the past and more recent work uh, uh, within the time frame that we have available. Uh, this one here was just to show uh, beginning because it is Black History Month, uh, October 15, 1966. Uh, it was when Bobby Seale and Huey Newton uh, formed the Black Panther Party. They were co-founders of the Black Panther Party. And maybe later on that year of 1967, it was shortened to the Black Panther Party because we began to get into more social programs and what we were involved in. So this was a, uh, a tribute to that historical uh, time. This is a symbolic of uh, the Panther the struggle continues. This is kind of like a more remix of the historical Panther, but the actual Panther came from Lowndes County during the South. And you can go online and you can see a lot of historical relevance to the similar Panther itself that came from Lowndes County, uh, Alabama in 1965 when the Voters' Rights Act was passed. And so you can go on Peacock to have a whole interview that's been on there for almost a year now that you can see that whole history from about Lowndes County. Uh, this is the one to the left. I call that Malcolm X, the warrior. The one on the right is Malcolm X, the father figure. This is Dr. King, the one to the left, Dr. King. The spirit of Dr. King, both of them. The right on the one I did when I was working for the black press, and I remixed it because they wanted to use it in their newspaper during that time. Uh, these blacks were sharecroppers in this, in, in this country. You should work some of the same fields that you have sharecroppers who are working today 
and uh, all up and down in the valley and what have you. This is re remixing and reinterpreting this brother to the left. He used to come by every week and buy his paper, even though he would be slushed. He would come in and he would buy his paper. And I remember we took some photographs of him, so I wanted to honor him in the context of the paper. But I wanted to also honor it in the context of uh, maybe more relevant information today where the paper itself talks about all power to the people and it's talking about global warming and those issues as opposed to then. That's the context of the paper itself. And same thing with that sister on the right. She used to come and sit in the back of my headquarters and she would read her paper every week when the paper came out. So it was highlighting her as well. And her paper says today's news. And what it says is about uh, justice, resist unjust laws, Glo SOS global warming. And it says respect Mother Earth. On the People Free Food Program, we, the pe we, here we are living in the land of plenty while we, the people, starve. The one to your right, don't support the greedy, toxic waste. This is dealing with the issue of fossil fuels and, and the global warming today. The one to the left, fossil fuel, and trying to symbolic show it as a danger with, with the little tag on the shirt. Love Mother Earth with the heart, green heart, globe. One to the right, educate to liberate. We also had to kind of let your sister maybe be hand handicapped. And we also were involved with that whole movement, which is Center for Independent Living. Uh, we had pa Panthers who were handicapped, who were our allies, who went and worked with them, the Center for Independent, for all the new laws in this country that you see, for ac uh, handicap access, what have you. Uh, we are involved in that as well. Survival pending revolution. These are maybe some of the social programs that we were involved in that we had back then. We had the free breakfast for children served here Mondays through Fridays, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., wherever across the country where we had 49 chapters and branches. We would sell breakfast with the community. We had them in churches, we had them in community centers, we had them in people's houses, wherever they open up the doors for those. We also had a, uh, we also had a uh, busing to prison programs. This, we had a bus that was given to us in Chicago, a Greyhound bus like, and we changed it into the Black Panther Party busing program where you give an announcement where we're gonna meet at on this, this weekend and you could come there and get a free ride to that prison to visit your loved ones who were incarcerated. We felt that that interaction, it would be, it was something that was helpful to stop the high it going back into the system. And we also had uh, actually a free ambulance service in Winston-Salem, South North Carolina, first chapter in the South, because the ambulance wouldn't come in in a, uh, 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 in a uh, reasonable time. Uh, we, had, we got certified ambulance service drivers and the community helped us buy an ambulance. So in Winston-Salem, we had a, uh, a people's free ambulance service. But we have also had alternative clinics all across the health clinics across the country. where We had doctors and nurses who volunteered their time to come in and help us with those services. We got photographs to show all this as well. So this is just the interpretation of it in the art expression. Uh, and we also had the uh, alternative school uh, first, we had liberation schools. Then we had the Oakland Community School. We had people like uh, Maya Angelou, who used to come and teach in the classes when it first opened. Amanada Masika and different persons used to come and uh, perform and do things with the kids. So we had all alternative, many things going on during that time. And as you see, the people's free food programs that we had as well. So this is what this stuff: people's free clinics, all that. To the right, Turtle Island, North America, indigenous territory. All North America is indigenous territory. And so this is what this was reflecting in that context. The original, original caretakers of the land. Health is wealth. 
and this is one I did to, I did this for 19, 19, uh, 19 uh, I think it was 1987. This one I did in 2007, and it's health, it's a reinterpretation of it, and it says health is wealth, I like this saying, yes, non toxic. This is one to your left was uh, take off on Kaepernick when he gave the knee. He inspired many, many young people and, uh, and adults across, across the globe. So I to, I, that's highlighted with the Kaepernick seven on his on the jersey. And the sister saying, I am we, I am we, an African bird. I am we because you are, because we are, I am, you are. And it says the struggle continues. I remix and reinterpret it again over here. And it says, little people against colonialism. Okay, this one is going. It's going, okay. This is one that's dealing with the, uh, maybe the working homeless or what have you. You can see, kid have kids. And on the badges, it says, I'm food insecure. On her badge, it says, I'm homeless. This is what gives context and content to the picture, depth and understanding about a social justice issue. Other than that, it would just be maybe a steady, nicely done picture. And when you add little things like that, it can bring home the concept, the idea of what we're talking about, about social, social programs and the homeless and all the other things that exist today. 45th year anniversary of the Black Panther Party. This was when we had it, and uh, it was said Black Panther Party, October 1966-1982, serving the community, body and soul. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. And as you see in the photograph itself, some of the images that I talked about, the free busing program, the free ambulance service, our free uh, breakfast program, all terms of schools, Senior program, senior gets a fearful environment. It was called safe, when it used to come to our community center, and uh, and and what have you. This is one again, like the first one I saw, Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, co-founders of the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. This is mother's love. This is father's love. Reparations, this was at the Museum of Contemporary Art Modern in, in Oakland, I mean, it's, yeah, in San Francisco, Modern Art in San Francisco. Uh, they asked me to, uh, doing the Diego Rivera uh, uh, exhibition where they had different muralists come in and they wanted me to create a mural to be a part of that. And so this is on the wall, was on that wall in, 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 at the museum. The, this is a, a, a Dinko symbol. And it symbolizes you are a slave of him whose handcuffs you wear. This is actual mural painted on the wall. Four women did this. It was two Latino sisters and two African American artists that I knew <coughs> that also had murals there. Who uh, I gave them the design and talked with them, and they did it for me. Because I don't get up there no more. I might have a senior, senior moment, so don't want <laughs> This is a warrior, uh, call a warrior woman. This is a remix. This is 1967. This is 19, say 2008, 2009, 2010, around right there. Here again, we're talking about black studies and self-defense. Again, we're still talking about self-defense, but we're talking black black studies in a, a different context. Left to the work, one to the left is uh, done with uh, banned books or books that had been uh, potentially were to be banned in the United States. There were over 100 something on the list. And uh, I was asked to contribute an exit uh, artwork to that. And I chose uh, Toni Morrison's with Blue as Eye. And she says something on the last page about you could be assassinated. So I wanted to so that you can be psychologically assassinated. You have to be psychologically assassinated as by bullets, but life's journey, as in the context of the story itself. 
here again to write is using the book is freedom. This was initially the first image of it at the bottom. It was done uh, on a when it, it's a rollers. It was done as a one of the what in William cuts wood cuts, and you cut them out and then you ink them up. But it's a big, so they had to bring in the trucks to do them on the ground and stuff like that. That's you know who that is. <laughs> you know who that is. You know he, he, he tells lies. If you're looking left, looking right, looking forward, it don't matter what. And fast as xenophobe. White only. Left justice resist unjust law. Ice cold wickedness. Mommy. Mama. Papa. Poppy. When they separating babies and from their mothers and their family, and they still have them put them together to this very day. Call him as Trump shithole president because he called Haiti, he called Africa, he called black countries shithole countries. So he's a shithole president. Arab, Muslim, Islam, U.S. government's coded word for terrorist hate, discrimination. Black male, U.S. government coded word for hate, discriminate, kill. Solidarity, BDS, boycott, divest, sanction, down with apartheid. Afro-American solidarity to your right with the Asian community when they created all the racism and using Asians that, in regards to the cause of all the problems going on in the world because of their account, because they couldn't deal with China. That's racism. That's institutional structural racism. This one here, justice, resists. Unjust laws, amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, freedom of religion, speech, and the press, boycott, divest, sanctions, down with apartheid. Peace heals, war kills. Ethnic cleansing, genocide. Made in America. Fascist mindset. Warmongering. Got five minutes, so I'll stop in five minutes. To the left, Barack Obama didn't give a peace speech, but he gave a war speech. So he was acknowledging that. He's, he's the one who signed the kill bill. That they can go around and kill anybody that they want to. If they even think they're terrorists, they don't have to be a terrorist. Crimes against humanity. This, this, they've been bombing and killing people in, uh, uh, over there in, in, um, in, the, in the Middle East for many, many, many years. The Tutsis and the, the, Hutu, the Hutu and all of them, that didn't just start. War, what war does to human beings, the psychological impact of war. This is the Five Bloods and the Jesus Messiah. I did posters for both of those that were used as a part of the, uh, the online uh, uh, PR. Global warming issues. So I think my time is about up. So I got three minutes. OK. I'll go through them so you can see them. Again, global warming. There's no planet B, C, or D. Save the planet now. Time is running out. Mother Earth, and that's that clock that they call doomsday clock, my interpretation at the bottom. Respect Mother Earth. Mother Earth, respect Mother Earth. This is, a, this is at a park in San Francisco. Free Haiti, stop the genocide. I could talk about them, but time does not permit, so I just show them to you. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. As much as things change, some things stay the same. Why do they get to burn us and we get to blame? Police Terror USA. The Black Code. 
A, per, a black person has no rights, which an institutional racist, racist judicial system is bound to respect. It gives the appearance of being fair and just when the biased decisions have already been decided. That was an Australia done with Aboriginal artist. They wanted to highlight that Peter Norman, who was in solidarity with the uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos in, Ab in Australia, he was banned and never allowed to run again because he was in solidarity with them at the 1968 Olympics. There's a whole history behind that as well. Justice. Uh, the opposite. This is dealing with the 43 young people who came, disappeared in Mexico, showing our solidarity. Again, this one is dealing with the, uh, a lot of talk about, but that was dealing with the, the Olympics. And prior to the Olympics, to the right, when the U.S. was giving and the government was giving guns and weapons and to the Mexican government before and during the 19 Olympics, when they did the slaughter prior to the Olympics starting in Mexico, when they claimed that only 63 people were killed, but there were over 300 people killed because it was acknowledged at that time, there's a lot more could be said about it, but that's it. That's what I was in. The, I was in doing Zapatistas, and when the Zapatistas started, I was in being by uh, acknowledged that we will come back and do paint that store again. And uh, Zap, uh, I'm going fast, uh, but uh, oh, anyway. But then the next year we came back, and that's what we did. It was a collective artists, about um, 18 of us, come together did this uh, store. And it was about solidarity, education, all those things were what the mural was reflecting in, in, in the thing. Okay, I must stop now. And now? One more minute, okay. And these are some of the images that were on there with the Zapatistas. Went back there four or five times. Caleb Duarte, a good friend of mine, invited me. These are some of the images that were up on the uh, Zapatista dials. The corn, they call itself people of the corn, and they grew with snails, pigs, they like humor. And that's where it says salute means edu and solidarity, education, production, culture, the Mayan. Yeah. This is interpretation of my images by my, Women's Mayan Collective, uh, 20 by 30 embroideries that are now in a museum in, uh, I think, over in uh, Italy, I believe, Italy or Spain. This is a Tiger Elementary School in Oakland, where, where I went visit, talked to a lot of young people, which I do that quite a bit. This is in this is in uh, uh, matter of fact, outside of uh, UK, in where I had an exhibit, and, and these youngsters came to from there. This is yeah, this is the exhibit itself. They had over forty three thousand people came to this exhibit from October of uh, nineteen. Uh, 2008 to 2000, April 2009, and this is opening night of that e exhibition. This is on the streets of uh, in New Zealand University, uh, e e Elam International School of Art. I was invited there for 41 days uh, to do an artist in residency, but there was so much uh, request to travel north and the South Island, talking about the historical context of the Black Panther Party. Because of the, and there still wasn't enough time. And a lot of people don't know that there were the Polynesian Panthers who became a official chapter of the Black Panther Party in 1971. This is a meeting at a, uh, at a library there where they're having an action because they were beginning to take their land. So they were planning some protests and stuff and they wanted me to contribute to that. And so that's what I can do right now. And maybe hopefully we can get it looping and you can see the rest. But Thank you. Okay, this is the uh, discussion portion of, of the evening, and um, 
once Emory and I have completed the discussion, we will invite you all to join us as well. So uh, thank you for your continued patience with this. And I just want to start this uh, first question. Uh, I want to provide a little bit of context, because what we have tried to do here is to bring Emory's work more into the present. Um, and I asked him to show fewer of the older images, which you'll begin to see now on the screen. Um, but getting into that would have um, cost us more time that we, than we have this evening. And of course, you can ask questions about anything you see or hear up here. But um, the Black Panther Party started out, it was originally, as Emory uh, mentioned, uh, named the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And they called it the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense because uh, there were obviously lots of issues in the black community at the time during the 1960s when the organization emerged. Uh, but one of the uh, most pertinent issues, one of uh, the most difficult issues to deal with was the issue of police brutality and murder of black people. Um, and it, it remains difficult to deal with. I can, I can tell you that as someone who teaches American history, who teaches uh, about this subject, um, that just as an example, and I'll get back to my point in a second, but just to give you this one example, um, in the era of lynching from 1890 to 1950, uh, there were 2.3 uh, black people lynched every week in the United States. And you know, how these statisticians come up with the 0.3, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that's um, the accepted number for the amount of lynching over that particular time period. Since 1950 up until 2016, which is when we have uh, the most recent numbers, so from 1950 to 2016, uh, police in the United States killed 2.3 black people a week. Uh, so there's really zero difference between the lynching era and the era that uh, many of us have lived through to, to this point. So back to my main point, which is the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, where this organization is trying to address this really difficult issue to deal with. They decided, um, teenagers, early 20s at the time, that they were gonna follow the police. You know, rather than the police following them, they were gonna uh, trail the police through the black community, which was pretty bold, and I'm not sure. Anyway, we'll talk about it. Um, and what we see uh, prior to that, in the year before the party was started, in October of 1966, there were 10 justifiable homicides, 10 murders by police uh, officers. After the Panthers started um, following the police from 1967 to uh, 66 to October 67, there were zero in the Bay Area. There were no shootouts. There was no real confrontation. And I, I guess I haven't been told about everything. Maybe there was, and you didn't mention it. But uh, the point is, when people decided to defend themselves, the killing stopped. So my first question uh, to you, Mr. Douglas, is you know, trying to get at the elephant in the room. Your, your art is obviously very wide ranging. It depicts family scenes and children playing and community gatherings, people at work, you know, individual portraits. But it also, during the time that you were an active member of the party, portrayed scenes of violence at a level that elicits visceral responses from people who saw it. Uh, of course, police and other people hated it, but even folks who weren't on that level were like, whoa, these guys are, are edgy. Uh, men and women are edgy. Can you share with the audience why you thought portraying violence against members of the establishment would be an effective educational tool? Well, to start off, uh, it was, it was re reacting to the violence against us and defending ourselves. We weren't the ones who were creating the violence, that created the violence. We were defending ourselves against the violence. And you have to understand that Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were the founders and co-founders of the Black Panther Party. They were the ones who wrote the 10-point platform and program with point number seven saying we wanted an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. And at that time, that was a very urgent need in, that country, in the country, just as it has been with Black Lives Matter in this, in this era of the police murders and being justified. And so they took up the, uh, the, 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 uh, the law, understood the law, uh, had worked in 
conjunction with the uh, with community centers where they had access to law books and what have you. So they had an understanding of the Second Amendment of the right to bear arms, but also understanding that you had a right to uh, observe arrests that were taking place as long as you were standing a legal distance away, not interfering with the arrest. Therefore, you weren't in violating of anything and, and, and explaining to those who were being arrested that they had rights, that they had the Fifth Amendment, they could take and not uh, say anything, or they could give the name, address, and what have you. And we would let them know that if we would try to bail them out, which we did on many occasions, you see. So that was why you have point number seven, it was uh, dealing with the, the, uh, the, the urgency. It could have been point number uh, two, uh, point number three, you know, education, housing, unemployment, all those were a part of the 10 point platform of the, of the Black Panther Party. But at that time, they initially started with the urgency. Uh, and it was like it was the community were supportive, but at the same time, you understand that the, con the, mental block, the mental consciousness wasn't there in many ways. There's a lot of young people. This was a youth organization. 15, 16, 17, 18 years old was the first group of Panthers who came together. I myself was only 22 going on 23. So this is on the job training. It wasn't like we had 50 years of experience. So that was the re reality of it. But it was the courage, because it could have been wiped off the map before it got off the ground. But having that 10-point platform, educating people about it, the interest that we were able to capture the imagination of the community and people, and they begin to see and begin to uh, support us. Not because, only because of the gun, because of the free breakfast program the free health clinics, and all the things that I talked about in the artwork itself. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the Black Panther Party gets mixed reviews from a broad range of scholars who, who write about it and from mm -hmm. filmmakers who feature in their work. For people who have not read a lot on the subject, um, so for people who haven't taken my class, hint, hint, um, what would you say are the two most important things to know about the Black Panther Party? In regards to where well, the Black Panther Party was uh, uh, community oriented. It was very informed on the issues. It didn't do things in the abstract, not understanding the, what could be the end results of it. To understand. So, and it led by example. That's the important thing. Led by example, we were able to critique and evaluate what we, our limitations and try to overcome them as we, and grew as we evolved. Yeah. So it wasn't like we were stagnant in, in, in regards to how we dealt with ourselves, the issues, or what have you. Yeah. And, and the example was certainly palpable for some groups. We know that um, other organizations during this particular period also model themselves on um, the Black Panther Party uh, philosophy. Can you just share an example of two of groups that did that? Well, there were many. We were inspired, not necessarily modeled on us. I think they were modeled on us because we were inspired by and in spirit with those before us. You had the, uh, and you had, you understand, you had the, uh, the deacons for self-defense who were deacons in the South who used to protect the community against the, the rage by the clans. You also had Robert Williams and Mabel Williams. Robert Williams was the head of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina, him and his wife. And he believed in self-defense. He was, he was suspended or expelled from the, the uh, NAACP because of the fact of his belief in self-defense. He, he even took the National Rifle Association and started a black rifle club, and they didn't like that. You see, he had his own, own publication called Dixie, you know? So in, in radio program, and he was talking about the politics of the time and the racism. And so that's why he had to leave the country. And he went to uh, China, from China, I think he went to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to I think, to, uh, to, to Africa. He was in Africa for a while. And then from Africa, he went to China. And there he was with Mao. We used to see him on, sitting on the, uh, went up with Mao Zedong. Uh, and the publication, The Crusader, and what have you. And he stayed there until uh, 1969, until he was uh, John Connors, in, 
who in, in Detroit, them were able to have him come back to Detroit. He stayed in Detroit until he was exonerated uh, there in Detroit. So this is a historical context that the Black Panther comes out of when you talk about the self-defense. You see, it's not just like uh, we, we, were, we were just out, out running wild, buck wild, you know. We were defending ourselves in this tradition of self in this country. Except when you read the newspapers, there's this impression. If you look at the Washington Post, the New York Times, mm -hmm. um, San Francisco Chronicle, it looks like you're kind of running wild. Well, I mean, those are main, it, when they can define you, they can engage you. Okay. So that's what they were doing. because So you have to be able to deal with that. When we had our newspaper, we were able to negate that. We were able to let the community know what the realities was, the alternative to that. And so they came to us to get the, the, the facts. It was so important to the fact, like institutions who used to invite us, schools, colleges, activists, all over the country, all over the, in this country and out, outside this country, to come and talk about the Black Panther Party and it, what it was about, yeah. So we were in solidarity as well. That's, that's great, because that leads me to my next question. And there's only one more after this, and we'll invite the audience to participate. Um, the Black Panther Party made it clear that it identified with and supported liberation struggles throughout the world. And you've mentioned some of that in your talk and presentation here. Um, I'm just curious if you are able to say to the audience, um, what do people need to know about the importance of acquiring and maintaining an internationalist perspective? Why is that important? Well, it's, for us, it was because it was interconnected to uh, overcoming the obstacles. You, you know, you're dealing in the belly of the beast who creates all this uh, exploitation and, and, what, and overthrowing governments around the world. And so we understood, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale understood that, along with many others in the Black Panther Party, and it were enlightening, enlightening everybody else who, who were becoming informed. And so that was always our... In our paper, we always had international section, just showing struggles around the world, what was going on in Vietnam, and solidarity with the Vietnamese struggle, solidarity with the struggle of liberation and movements in South America and all over the world. You know, yeah, I, I, I was always a part of the Black Panther Party. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this last question is actually hypothetical, so you may feel as if you're being put on the spot here. Um, and I think it's okay. Uh, if you could go back and change one aspect of the Black Panther Party's overall experience, what would it be? Nothing. Because I would, I would say that we always were, and I, why I say nothing, because we were always in the context of, like I say, we weren't, over, like to say we were, we were on job experience. It wasn't 50, we didn't have 50 years of experience. So, so for us, the last the 10, 11 years that we did, we were always critiquing and evaluating ourselves and our limitations. That doesn't mean we overcame the obstacles that we were confronted with on our internal sh shortcomings. But we put things in position to deal with those issues, you see. So in that context, what else could we have done? You know, because we did do it. We did try and make the effort. You know, but we're dealing with a, a force, an internal force, a beast that we had to deal with. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that engagement. And now we're going to invite our audience members to ask a few questions before we wrap up. I see one hand over here um, and one over there, Jake. So. Well, that one is uh, I wasn't uh, always, I wasn't, I never have marketed anything I've done. It's pe people who have been interested, institutions and others have been interested in the work. So, uh, you know, and I have a, a, a advised, legal advisor now because it's not the Black Panther Party, it's, you know, in, in that context that I, I'm being asked. But as you say, so in that context, that's the way I survived. And I did, uh, you know, work for the black press. I still continue to do work because the black press that I work with were in solidarity and supportive of us. 
when we were in the Black Panther Party. They used to write about us and supported us, you see. So when they knew the Black Panther Party was divided, they asked me to come work for them because I used to send people over from my cadre who used to be work with me to work with the black press when they need assistance and what have you. You see, so in that context, I always was able to uh, have a, a basic support, yeah. But in the Black Panther Party, we would be evolved to be living collectives. And living in collectives, you had uh, Panthers who had GI loans. So with those GI loans, we, had, we bought houses. We had others who helped us buy houses. And, and, and then we were able to know how to play the game, to live into how, uh, move into a place. And, uh, and we had to set up our own agency. So when they call, they want to know if so-and-so got a good, good record, a job record, or had they been doing whatever it is for the qualification, and that person would say yes, then we get to stay there. Then we stay there until we, and then when they want us to move us out, then we know what time, how long we had to stay before they moved us out. You see? So we know how to play that game as well. For the people, for the sake. We're not just for the sake of doing it, but for the sake of collecting. And then we moved people in real estate, all that. You know, we weren't just isolated, limited, you know, I mean, we, we were connected, and connected to the world, the community, and everybody. And, and I would just add to that, yeah. um, as a person who studied it, that uh, I did interview uh, the accountant for the Black Panther Party. And he told me that there was so much money from just random people being sent to the Black Panther Party that they had to hire people to open the envelopes. So some of those funds came from random, unknown citizens, maybe non-citizens, who just thought the work they were doing was really good. And according to our Marty Kenner, this is this guy's name, it could have been $2 or it could have been $200. And of course, back in the 60s and 70s, it was, uh, would have been quite a bit of money. But I saw a question over here. Thank you for coming and giving this presentation. It's been awesome. Um, I really loved your line, when they can define you, they can negate you. And I was wondering what your perception is of social media sort of creating that global idea and that international idea among people in this day and age and how it can help future groups that are trying to accomplish the same efforts. I heard it, but I didn't hear some of it. Would you, would you mind restating the question, please? Yes. Um, so I was wondering how you think social media in today's day and age might have a more internationalizing effect on folks uh, because you had mentioned when they can define you, they can negate you. And we're kind of in an era where that negation is being negated by social media in a lot of ways. And I know sometimes that can be like a echo chambery instance, but uh, people seem to avoid some of the negation from like news that they couldn't before. So the impact of, of social media on the point you made about being negated by... Mm, are you talking about now? Or now. now? Well, uh, it's a tool. As I said the other evening, it's a tool that you use, you know. Uh, I, I understand, you, you know, we don't, con we don't you know, with it, those who, you know, the profiteers, the exploiters, those are the ones who control it, but they actually, but in the same time, they can't lock out activists at the way they want to. You see, so you use it as a tool to inform, enlighten, and to educate. I mean, but, but it's, they try, you know, it's, that's, that's what the main press is, all a part of that, you know, is to, if they can, like I said, if they can, it's, they, it's mental bondage, you could say, in a way. If they have you, can have you believe in the lie, then, then that's, you know, they've succeeded. It does really seem to be a, a double-edged sword. If we think back to 2020, mm -hmm. how social media kind of uh, blew up after the George Floyd incident, and we had what eventually turned into the largest demonstration since the 60s, and quite frankly, even larger mm -hmm. than those demonstrations. So uh, very little negation yeah. uh, with that. Once, as you yeah. said at the beginning of your talk, once the power of the people is being exercised, it's hard for any of that to be effective. And, and you know, you got a whole, you got, you do have a lot of alternative media out there now. 
That, and that's, if it didn't have that, you wouldn't be understanding what's going on in reality now, just right now. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, want, I wanted to say thank you, uh, Emery Douglas, for, uh, for coming through. This is really amazing to see you in person, and I just respect the kind of contribution you've given to just culture in general and aesthetics in general in a global sense as far as resistance and struggle, and I'm incredibly inspired. And, and, and humble to, uh, to sit before you and ask a question. I just wanted, I want to note, actually right now, uh, Professor Curtis is a student and some other people at Mecha Day ASU are being under investigation, a dual investigation by both the university and law enforcement for propagandas that uh, they illustrated the connection between uh, uh, certain uh, economic dominations here as well as Palestine and, and uh, relevant corporate entities that play a part in both. And uh, I, I hope you guys are, I hope you, Professor Curtis, are supporting Mecha de ASU in, in their fight against that investigation. I also just wanted to understand a little perspective and ask uh, uh, how, how you, Emery Douglas, would, uh, uh, how you think arts and culture play into making space for safety for ideas and any sort of uh, inclinations or notions surrounding that that you could uh, indulge in in a little bit. I'd be interested. The last part in this book, but I did hear some of it now. Um, how do you make? How art and culture creates a safe space. Well, it, 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 art and culture, maybe, I don't know if it, safe space may be your word that you feel that it does, but I think art and culture is a, a tool. It's a language. It's a visual language. It's a, uh, it's, a, a it's, it, it, it gives you a visual interpretation of the struggle. It, it, it supports the, the social and political justice narrative of the, of, the, of the struggle in many ways through the performing arts, through the visual arts, all those, uh, you know. So I, I think in that context, it's, it's relevant, you know. It's relevant because you bombard it with art 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, when you awoke. So you're seeing something that deals with some form of art. So, you know, in that context, if it's a, it catches the attention, it informs, it can enlighten, it can inspire. Yeah. Um, so if you are to engage in um, any kind of artistic you know, expression or impression today, how would you tell the black story in, in the light of the current dispensation? I'm looking at how these artistic expressions or impressions have told, um, I don't want to say darker side of the story of the black people in the U.S., there have been um, beautiful stories being told of how community engagement has improved the lives of black people in this country. So I'm saying that if today you are to, you know, engage in such ventures again, how would you pre present the black story? How do, how do I present it in my art today? Exactly. Uh, unfortunately, we, I wasn't able to get through the, uh, I got about a third or halfway through the, uh, the, the it, more recent images. Maybe you weren't in here, but I talk about those, that in those images, in the context, yeah. But you don't have to understand, today you have so many special interests, and you have solidarity. When you talk about solidarity, you got, you're talking about a solidarity in the context of people, in, in the context of how they see it, in the context of their cultural identifications and what have you. So you, the scope is more diverse and dynamic than it was then, in the 1960s, you see. So you're dealing with a whole other level, another world con con context of dealing with social justice issues. Yeah. You have to be mindful, you know, of others. You can't go over to, um, as a sister Joseph, actually go and be invited to New Zealand or Australia trying to tell them how they should deal with their social justice issues. You have to be in solidarity with that. If they may they be inspired by a in spirit with how you do it, but they may have a different concept, purpose, culturally linked to how they deal with it. 
So you have to be mindful of that as well. You know. So it's, it's, it, can, it's, it can be a, a very uh, layered kind of way you, how you deal with the issues of social justice today. Yeah. But it's still what we're going to do here. Now, <laughs> you know, right now, yeah. Take two, two more. Three? Okay, we'll take three more. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to do this real quick. Thank you very, very much for, for that, all right, because it, it brought back memories and like that scene that's there now. Uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I, your artwork sort of evokes me is I remember uh, looking at Life and, and Look Magazine and, and, and seeing Norman Rockwell, mm -hmm. all right? And so my question to you really is, uh, in terms of uh, to what extent, were you, especially when you were young and you were trying to sort of communicate community, you were saying you were going to, so you were aiming for a black aesthetic that would counter Norman Rockwell. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, in, in the context of, uh, you know, I came out during the, the, the black conscious era, and that means the era when we begin to define ourselves, talk, talk about black, black power. Power, black power means about self-determination. And in that context, and so that's the period of when I became involved in the 1960s, eight, 60, no, excuse me, 65, 66, I'm not going on, you know. And so uh, it, it, uh, it was uh, wanting to contribute the art that I did to something that was dealing with social justice issues. And that became the Black Panther Party in that context, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it was never wanted to be. I did remember looking at the magazines of Norman Rockwell as a kid, and thought it was interesting art, you know, and what have you. But I never tried to duplicate one to be like Norman Rockwell. But I do also remember my auntie used to get this calendar every year, uh, this because I used to stay with her. My mom was legally blind, but so my but I used to stay with my auntie in the housing projects and out in, uh, in San Francisco. And she would get this black this calendar every year with this black artist. And I used to look at it. I was all at it. And I come to see, when I grew up, I come to see that that was uh, Charles White. So that was kind of inspiration to me, you could say, in that, that sense. Yeah. Because every year, she, the insurance company, she pay her insurance, 50 cent, a dollar, whatever it was. She get the calendar. Yeah. And you'll see the amazing art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we always, I didn't negate my, Norman Rockwell. You know, but it's just that I wasn't informed by him in, in the relationship to how I wanted to do my art. I've seen some things that he did that was maybe relevant to that, to that broader culture in that context. Uh, I did learn something too that he had a, he was a social, he wasn't, he wasn't a bigot because he has some, some brothers and sisters who worked with him who he knew were knew well. And not only that, the normal, I did had an exhibit uh, print exhibit at the Norman Rockwell, which they reached out to me to have. That was just last last year. Yeah. It's interesting how things change. So, um, I can't remember what the other two. Well, I, I know where one is right here, but I can't remember what the the last one was. Okay, one up there and one down here. There it is. Um, so it's such an honor to have you here, and thank you so much for the gorgeous images that you've given and the visual history. I wonder if you could talk with us about how tragedy and grief were part of that Black Panther experience for you mm -hmm. and how that either impacted your art and the people that you were making art for um, because the violence and the tragedy and the loss, mm -hmm. the way in which those of us who are learning about it, we see that it was so close um, and the targets were meant to hurt, as you say, mentally, emotionally, not just physically. Mm -hmm. How did all of that upheaval and that sense of the, the experience of the violence impact your art? Well, it, it made it uh, self-determination to show it in a, in a way of uh, resistance of, of it in, 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 in that, and uh, steadfast, even if it was painful or what have you. In the artwork, yeah, I, I think um, it it, uh, it comes out sometime in the work itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it, it was also dealing with the issues as well around the art, 
you know, was very, very strong. I mean, it's no, no way that you can do, I don't think you can do the artwork and have an impact of it if you don't, if it doesn't come from the soul, from the spirit, from in, internally, from you, yeah. And that is, is a, a very good point. I'll get the, the last two. But actually, uh, Emory, earlier this afternoon, we were talking about this, this very question. Um, and by the way, everyone, this is Professor Lois Brown. She runs the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and um, actually helped us to, to advertise for this event. So thank you for that question. But what I wanted to remind you is we were actually talking about that this afternoon, and you made the point that we weren't, he was talking about the party. We weren't the only ones suffering and having all these problems. He talked about what was going on in Vietnam and Central and South America and with other people's struggles. And so it was helpful to him, if I can just kind of quote you, um, to know that they weren't the only ones having these setbacks. And so that helped them to continue on. Obviously, there's no comparison. I think there must have been something like 30 or 40 members of the Black Panther Party who was killed, but then you're talking millions of Vietnamese, mm -hmm. which helped them to gain perspective. And so very, very good question. We appreciate that. Um, the woman um, who actually is a person I know, Professor Perkins, uh, in the back is the next to the last. And, and I thought I saw one hand, and this hand is, is going to be the last. And I see your hand, sir. We have to take off. You can come up and be the first to actually ask him afterwards. So, so these two, and we'll wrap up. Professor Perkins. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. It's, it's, as everyone's saying, a real privilege to have you here and to get to see some of your work. Uh, mine's just a very pragmatic question. If we want to spend more time with your art, where can we do so? Uh, I see you have a 2014 book. Is there another one coming out? Is there a biography on the way? Do you put your stuff on a website? <laughs> now, you ask me, do I have a bar for coming out? Yeah, or no, you know, no, is somebody don't. working on it? Uh, no, I, I, I'm working on another art book with Colette Gator, artist, professor from Delaware University in relationship to the more recent work. And it, I think that's the biography that I wanted to talk about, have, <laughs> reflecting the artwork, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. Can, they, can they find anything on your Facebook page? I don't, yeah, I mean, I put always, my Facebook page is open, you know, and I put stuff on there all the time, yeah. But if you go through the images, sometimes now they snatch them out, you know, they don't, you know, they, they limit kind of stuff, because I look for stuff that I had on there 2007, it's not there now, you know. And so that notion shows me that they're going into their uh, blocking it or cutting it down or cutting it back or whatever, how they, you know, but it's, you know, yeah, but I do put artwork on there and my page is open. I always put relevant information about what's going on in the real world, news and stuff on it to share. Yeah, that I think is relevant. Mm -hmm. But uh, I appreciate you talking about the biography, but uh, you know, I, I, for me, I've been asked that before, but I think more important is about the artwork and maybe integrate the biography into a, 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 an art book as opposed to just a straight biography for me. Yeah, I like that idea because you have some interesting stories to tell, especially how you were brought into the party and some of the things that happened to you while you were there. So um, this uh, question uh, here, Jake, if we could get the mic. I, I think I got it already. Have it. Thank you. So I really appreciated seeing of your some of your more contemporary work and some of your um, updated versions mm -hmm. of the art you'd made in the past. There was one that really caught my eye, and I was wondering if you could speak to why you made a particular decision. The one where there was the woman who had a gun at the first version, and then it became a book mm -hmm. in the more contemporary version. I'm wondering if you could talk about why yeah. you made that choice. Well, in the context of also in Self, still believe in self-defense and defending oneself if you have to. But you know, the world is going more towards, people are going more towards peace and harmony. They're trying to, you know. But it's the, uh, it's the government that's going, it's a, war, it's a war economy and all those things. But, to, and, but I look at it in the context so you have to love, love, understand the, what a, people's consciousness is. So to say the same things, in a different way, 
but say the same thing. You see, it's not that it has shifted to something more pacifist pacif or something that's not dealing with social justice issue, but it's dealing with it coming from a, no, another perspective that's more digestible for a broader audience. I've had uh, people come, uh, this lady I knew came to one of my things I did at UCLA, and when she said it was over, he said, He's, you're saying the same thing that you did said 60 years ago, but you just said it in a different way. So that's the math trying to, that's what I've been developing to master, how you do that and, and integrate and doing that in the art itself. But say it in a different way that's broader and more digestible. And uh, a little bit of a different in interpretation. I'd like to make this um, final point, actually, and to thank somebody who, who's here. A couple of people. I don't. I don't see the other one, but uh, we have two ASU um, MFA art students who who helped us put this together as well. Uh, Wawila Mugala and Ariana Barley, who you would probably think that the art on the wall is from Emory. Um, this art here, but actually it came from one of ASU's own students. And so as we wrap up, I wonder if we could get Ariana to talk about um, just, you know, the deal with, with the art on, on both sides. So, uh, Jake, if you could get her the, the mic right quick and then we'll wrap up. Hi, again. Good to see you again. Um, yeah, well, Wheela and I were super excited when we were approached by Jacob and Curtis to make these artworks, to live in this space during this talk, um, and to be in conversation with you last night. Thank you for that again. Um, as far as the quilts, uh, coming from Alabama, I'm really interested in quilting as a visual language of resistance in itself, um, and while Wheela, as a printmaker, I work primarily in textiles, so this collaboration felt like a really great opportunity for us to kind of exercise both of those mediums as um, resistance tools to kind of echo your visual language and the visual language that was so prominent in the Panther Party. Um, and then we did some risograph prints, which is what you're seeing below these and in some of your seats, um, which a lot of the imagery we got online through Curtis's instruction, you kind of pointed us towards where we could find some of these images. Um, and really just looking to play up these symbols and images that were used as a visual language of resistance to kind of occupy this space for this talk. And we were really excited to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for that, and thank you all for coming. We have um, touched the surface here. This was an organization that did uh, exist for um, 11 years. It was an organization that was vilified in the media, but when you look at um, its history in, in the community, um, we're talking Asian people, Latin, Latinx people, white people, black folks all over this country and all over the world identified with the Black Panther Party and its philosophy. And it wasn't just a gun, as he, as he mentioned, um, uh, guns were brought up in their 10 point platform and program uh, in point seven, and there were, there were just 10 points. And so it wasn't at the top um, of their necessarily philosophical concern, although it was obviously important uh, to deal with. And so I just want to say I appreciate you on a night uh, right before school is uh, supposed to be out, and we're going to go and hopefully have a nice restful uh, spring break. Not all of us will rest. A lot of us have to continue to work. Um, but this is very, very kind of you to show up on this evening, and we thank you uh, so much. So appreciate it.